Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures for the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance that you'd be interested in checking out our third annual facilitation summit. Due to the pandemic, we are going virtual this year, and we've got some really awesome things waiting for you. We have 18 master facilitators, and each day, six of them will be sharing 20-minute lightning talks in the morning and facilitating workshops in the afternoon. Each attendee will get to see 18 talks and three workshops over three days. There are plenty of networking opportunities to connect with other attendees, plus games and prizes. I would also like to thank Mural, our exclusive conference sponsor. Mural is an online collaboration tool that we'll be using during the conference. Hope to see you there. Register today at voltagecontrol.com slash events. Today, I'm with Ben Aston. Ben is a digital project manager and online entrepreneur. He's the founder of Black and White Zebra, an indie media company on a mission to help people and organizations succeed. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thanks so much for having me, Doug. Absolutely. So let's start off by hearing a little bit about how you got started. Yeah, well, I guess for me, I guess my journey begins probably back when I was 14 and um, started building websites. The first, I think my first major website was the world of uk, which no longer exists, but maybe you can find it on Wayback Machine. But I think, yeah, that starting building websites um, like more than 20 years ago uh, was, I guess, how it really all started and really got my excitement and passion about the, I guess, the opportunities that online presents uh, and the way that it can make a big world really small. So, yeah, it all started back in back in the 90s. Yeah, I can I can relate. That's when I started my journey, and uh, the world's quite different. I was actually recently comparing the the predicament we're in right now to the early '90s or the late '90s, uh, around when we were first starting to see e-commerce come online. Right. And now, with the the advent of all these new digital meeting tools and collaboration tools, we have to keep in mind they're in their infancy. You know, like. Uh, the, and we we think back to the where where e-commerce was back then. You know, it can help us give a little bit of visibility in where we might be headed. Definitely, yeah. Things were. <laughs> I think do you know. I remember like the first time or the first few times that I went on the internet, which in those days meant getting a magazine from the shop, um, getting a CD from CompuServe, putting it in your putting it in your computer and it had us like you'd get 30 minutes free internet or something when you bought a magazine and uh, yeah it is really strange to think you know with a dial-up modem um, accessing the internet using a cd somehow (laughs) and creating your CompuServe account and then you go to the internet which was just a directory page on the CompuServe homepage, and that was it that was the gateway into the world wide web which was um and you weren't quite sure what to do with it or where to go um, but you knew it was, it was definitely exciting. So, um, yeah, I think when we think about meeting technology and compare that with, yeah, how far the internet has come um, in 20, 30 years, uh, then, yeah, the opportunities for meetings in the future, I think, is really exciting. Yeah, when you, when you, th- when you kind of think back to young Ben, at the shop getting the the uh the magazine and you know rushing home to get online fire up the modem here here the whole the blips and bloops you know the the, the little squawk (laughs) that's a noise that people don't know anymore (laughs) i know i know it's a a good noise (laughs) i know it's uh, nostalgic yeah um so imagine there's a young ben today you know logging on the zoom and one day they'll be reflecting back on how how strange it was to you know to be, to see each other in little squares on a flat screen. What do you what do you think that future Ben will be doing compared to to today and you know this flat Zoom experience? Well, yeah, I don't know. I think 
I look at uh, one of the, one of the things my kids really enjoy is the um, the Google Animals. You know, when you search for an animal on Google, and then you can you have this like augmented reality type thing where you can have an octopus in your room crawling around the floor and floating around. And um, so, yeah, I think the the way that meetings are currently constrained to a screen um, feels a bit archaic and um, limiting. When I yeah, I think what's what would be exciting is if people were more in the room with you and it was more augmented reality. So I think the kind of that ability to turn to different people and talk to different people, uh, bringing that into a space that's not a screen would be super powerful, as well as the audio problem, which we have where, you know, you can only have one person really talking at once. Um, and the way that you interject um, with one another in real life is not the same as what happens on Zoom, where Zoom decides who gets to talk by putting the green square around them. And so just conversation is a lot more stilted. So some some audio improvement and some augmented reality hologram type thing, uh, I think is what I'm looking forward to. I hope that's, hope that's on the roadmap soon. Yeah, you know, it, it makes me think about 3D audio and how... Yeah. You know, in games, you can move around spaces and they get, you know, sound sources get louder or quieter. But here in these meeting systems that we use, it's like, it's all, it's just on or off. There's no, there's no spatial volume adjustment. Yeah. And I think there's also, I mean, the part of the meeting that um, is also kind of missing for me is the, is the wrap up component where, the is the entering the room and leaving the room in a uh in real life the entering and the the leaving of the room what happens just before the meeting and just after the meeting uh, you miss that currently in digital uh because that's actually where some of the most important conversations happen like yes you've wrapped up the meeting and you're just going to the next thing but that as you're walking down the corridor with someone or you're just joking around with someone. It's just very different in a digital world, and I'm not quite sure what the solution is there. But that part of the meeting for me is is something that's missing. Yes, we can talk to one another, but a meeting is more than just communicating about the topic. There's the trust-building component. There's the relationship-building piece, which I think we lose a lot of when we're doing it over Zoom. Yeah, 100%. I think it requires a lot more preparation and facilitators have to lean in and support that and, and how they plan to be intentional about it. Because to your point, if, it, if we're in a, in a room together, we can just kind of serendipitously allow it to emerge and we don't have to plan for it so much. So I, I agree when the software can help support some of that stuff, it'll, it'll be great because we won't have to work so hard. Yeah. And I think there's that that leave meeting button part of it as well, where you <laughs> click on it and you've gone. That is, that's it. Whereas, yeah, in real life, you know, you get up from your chair, loiter around a bit, hang out by the door. Um, I don't know, a bit more of a, uh, <laughs> making more of the entrance and exit. And I think this is where the, um, the hologram comes into it. But uh, so that, yeah, you still have a meeting. I think you're so right about being intentional and the, the, the importance of planning an agenda so that the meeting is really useful. But I think how we can facilitate the relationship building outside of the meeting itself, but within the context of a meeting is important too. Yeah. And, you know, I'm always really curious what types of meetings people are having and, and finding, you know, uh, magic. We, we, we have a book that's about to come out called magical meetings. And so it's, it's a, uh, a journey of mine, a quest of mine to find everyone's magical meetings. And, you know, some people love stand up. Some people love like, you know, a retrospective, or I was recently hearing about someone who uh, designed a meeting for 30 different teams to come together. So just curious if you've had any, any interesting, challenging meetings or that were fun to like try and figure out and make work or, or something that just you get a lot of value out of. Yeah, so t two of them spring to mind. Uh, we're recording on a Friday today, and one of the meetings that we typically have on a Friday afternoon is Friday. And um, we it's sharing the wins from the week, because I think uh, so often we can go through a week, and on a Friday as well, uh, particularly when we're remote, 
the kind of distinction between where Friday ends and the weekend begins. Uh, and then when Monday starts again, it almost seems like a bit of a blur. So our Friday meeting is a chance for us just to check in with one another uh, remotely at the end of the week on a Friday afternoon and just share our big wins from the week. And it's really just focused on uh, helping people celebrate what's gone well, um, talking about the things that uh, that they're excited about, that um, accomplish- accomplishments that they've made, um, and just a really just a chance for people to connect and feel good about themselves and the team um, going into the weekend. Uh, so yeah, that's our Friday meeting, and then on uh, Mondays we have more of a retrospective. So we do a metrics review every Monday. So each Monday we call it Elevenses, and it's at eleven o'clock on a Monday, where we'll do a review of the week before. So we'll go through our key metrics and just talk about the things that w- that seem to stand out, anything that's um, worthy of discussion. Um, and then in that meeting as well, so we, it's a bit of a retrospective, but it's also a way for us to talk about the week ahead. So what the kind of the question that I always leave people with, um, and we just kind of go around on the call, it's like, what is the most impactful thing? What's the single most impactful thing that you're going to work on this week? Because I think it's really important that we really focus um, our attention and our team's attention on on creating impact. And we all have, especially on a Monday, a big long laundry list of things we can or should or could do. But I think bringing it back to impact and and really asking people that question, what is going to be most impactful? Is it that thing that... um, you know, that is on the top of your list? Or is it actually the thing that's on the bottom of the list that you haven't been wanting to do for a while? So really drawing people's attention into impact, I think is really helpful. I love that. And is, do you have ways to focus on the impact or the types of impact you're trying to drive? You mentioned the metrics. I, I was kind of imagining some kind of visual that folks were like f- focused on, but I was kind yeah. of... Yeah, so we've got a metrics dashboard. Um, We're currently actually trying to put it into a tool called Databox, uh, which is a cool data visualization thing, a bit like Microsoft Power BI. But the cool thing about Databox, it's not too complicated. It connects with all kinds of different tools and you can do kind of calculations within the tool as well. Anyway, right now we're just using Google Sheets. So what we're looking at is, yeah, I'm I'm sharing a screen. We have our metrics uh, and we're just going through really the bottom of funnel metrics. So we're not looking at all the factors that drive these metrics. We're looking at the kind of key performance indicators, the results that's just in a table. We've got the kind of weeks uh, in columns. We've got the metrics down uh, row by row that are important for us. And we're just going down the, going down this column, looking at the metrics and and asking people everyone's got a responsibility so there's different people's names on different metrics and um, i'm just looking for a comment or insight into why things are the way they are and um, if there's anything we should be excited about or concerned about how long have you guys been doing the uh the lovens lovens is i don't know it's been a while it used to actually be an exercise that we did every day um because i just really wanted to focus people's attention on hey, these are the things that matter. These are the metrics that matter. Let's do impactful things that impact these numbers because if these numbers are heading in the right direction, uh, then we're doing well. Like this is, these are the, these are the KPIs for us. But I think it's been, I don't know, probably a couple of years now. Uh, But we probably a year ago reduced it to once a week because it was becoming an hour long meeting every day, which is too much. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, so what have you noticed in this kind of two years now, one year of doing it weekly? Have you noticed shifts in the team or, or comments or feedback on on the Elevenses and the, what it's created for the team? I think I think the the great thing about it is that it focuses people's attention. And uh, by having it the first thing that we do every week when we begin the meeting – Actually, the first thing we do is not actually look at the metrics. The first thing we do is tell stories from the weekend. <laughs> and um, yeah. that's, that's actually how, the, that's how the, the weekly meeting starts is let's connect with one another. And then we're looking at the metrics through that lens of, you know, friendship and connection rather than 
Show me the numbers. Yeah, I often tell people a lot of times these these meetings are for for the connection, you know. And if we honor that fact and say, "Hey, this isn't a pointless meeting. We're actually having it, so we can bring people together and have the weather report." Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like, um, and we actually begin, yeah, that elevens is with a like a show and tell. I really encourage people to like come with a story, come with a picture to share. Tell us, tell us something interesting that you did, uh, because I think it's so important, particularly when we're remote, that we find ways to connect with people and build our relationship with them, even if, even if we're not, you know, face to face, even if we're not connecting uh, in real life. So yeah, I think those those stories and creating that connection is super important before we actually get into the numbers. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, it serves another purpose too. It's like the boot up time, right? If people come in and they've got like something on their mind that's like really dragging them down, we can use, we can use levity and connection to like get everyone centered and, and together. Definitely. Yeah. So I want to come back to the Fridays. I'm a big yeah. fan of, uh, appreciative inquiry and, and, and positivity. It can be really powerful. Um, so how long have you been doing the Fridays? Uh, that's, that is a lot more recent, actually. That's, that's only been a, like a couple of months, probably. Oh, wow. How's that been turning out? Yeah, it's, it's good. I think it's, I think the, with, with our company and our organization, I think we actually, we work in a quite a siloed way. And so finding ways to like, in many ways that we can go for days without all meeting together because we don't have to. And actually I'm quite comfortable with that because I, I mean, I personally despise being in a meeting where there's no value. So, so actually, this was just a good opportunity to be intentional about connecting with one another and having no purpose, no real agenda other than sharing good news, which I think is gets everyone pumped. And typically, do you know, it's not even a scheduled meeting. So part of the fun of Friday is the serendipity of it as well. It's that people know I'll post a message saying, should we every, anyone up for Friday right now? And, um, you know, it's Friday afternoon. So people are normally, you know, slowly I'll see on Slack, people say, yes, 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 yes. And then we're like, okay, let's do it now. And, um, and everyone hops on. And so, yeah, I think it just builds a bit of a sense of excitement around it. And everyone can find something good to say. And I just think cultivating that culture of positivity and encouragement and saying well done to one another, appreciating people and giving me an opportunity to say, hey, great job. Um, I think that's that's super helpful and motivating, just makes people feel good about themselves. Yeah, it's like if you don't reserve the time, sometimes it's it's easy for for those moments to float away and, and miss them. Definitely. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is an optional extra kind of meeting, right? And I think with many of these I mean, I'm going to class it as an HR style uh, meeting. We wouldn't need to do it if we were all in the same office together. It would be happening organically throughout the week. But I think as we're all working remotely, we're not just shouting across the room when something exciting is happening anymore. Um, or, you know, someone might post something on Slack saying, oh, this happened today, but it's not quite the same. So I think having having more of that celebration, I think, is can only be a good thing. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, I love it. So kudos for that. Let's see. I, I, I was also wanting to, to just hear a little bit about, you know, when, when you've seen teams get stuck and lose momentum, what are, what are some of your favorite ways to kind of get them reengaged? Yeah, I think sometimes we lose momentum because we've lost sight of the vision. And so I think bringing, Bringing things back to uh, the basics of why we're doing something in the first place, I think, is super important. And I think when we've lost momentum, yet it, it can often be because really we've lost sight of why we're doing something in the first place. And for me, that's actually why it's so important that uh, we, we're constantly reminded of the metrics and everyone's aware of what we're doing and why we're trying to do those things. But bringing it back down to, okay, here's the rationale, here's ultimately the mission of what we're trying to achieve as an organization. And here's how this task or this project fits into that vision. Let's kind of join the dots again. Let's connect this in people's minds so they can see the importance of what they're doing and how that fits into the bigger picture of what we're trying to achieve. 
So realigning, recasting vision, I think is important. Joining the dots. But I think also being honest with ourselves and each other and say, hey, do you know what? Maybe we're doing the wrong thing here. Like Maybe there's a reason that we have lost momentum. Is this the right tactic to help align us with that, with the vision and the goals? And really just opening up things for discussion, I think is important as well. Because sometimes by playing devil's advocate and, you know, asking people, does this really make sense? Is this, is this a waste of time? Should we be really doing this? Should we be doing something slightly different? Sometimes that helps people get buy-in as they then have to play back to you why it's purposeful, why it's meaningful, how it aligns with the bigger vision and mission. So I'm um, getting others to play that role of that leadership role uh, can help then convince themselves that what they're doing is important. But I think it could, I think it's worth examining as well. Like, you know, why why has this stalled? What is going wrong? Oftentimes, as well, it can be simply because the objectives were unclear in the first place. Um, so sometimes it's just a case of re-clarifying the brief and mm. that can then create the clarity towards, ah, now I get it. These are the, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And this is why it's meaningful. And when you talk about recasting or re-examining the, the visions, what, are, are there some tactics that folks can use to, to do that work? I think for us, when I'm thinking about, okay, what's our overall vision, um, and strategy, that's that's something that doesn't change very often. But I think asking people questions to try and help them understand why it is we're, why it is we're, we're doing something uh, can really just help unlock a problem. So digging into just, just asking people to think about, okay, well, why does this matter? Why is this worth doing? Um, what are we going to hit and hit what, what kind of advantage or benefits does it give to who? So like, who's going to be impacted with this and what will the impact be? Like, will it be that people succeed? Well, how will they succeed? Why will they succeed? Um, why is it meaningful? What difference will it make? Will it impact uh, their boss? Will it impact their team? Uh, who's going to be who's going to be impacted and why does that matter? And I think just kind of drilling down into the impact uh, can really help us um, solidify the vision, but also make the vision more meaningful and, and worthwhile. I like that. You know, it's like, what is that impact or outcome that's getting driven and how are we going to have influence over it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and choosing, uh, and, and recognizing that, yeah, that, that influence is, uh, not something just to be taken for granted. Like, Hey, we're doing something that actually matters here. And I think, Particularly, again, when we're remote, we can just become consumed by the four walls that we're um, living, eating, sleeping, playing in. And, um, and you know, I think losing sight of vision is a, is a real challenge, particularly in this um, COVID-infused <laughs> environment that we're currently in. And uh, getting people to really just poke their heads above the parapet a bit, uh, be brave, see the bigger world out there, um, and yes, and see the bigger picture of what's going on and, and how their work is still meaningful, I think is important. So I want to talk a little bit about what you're proud of. So as you reflect over the last, you know, year at the very least, if not further back from, you know, maybe when you, when you founded Black and White Zebra, you know, I, regardless of how far you go back, what what do you, what kind of comes to mind when you think about things you're proud of? Uh, I guess a big big picture it would be, I'm proud of leaving a comfortable full time job and starting my own thing. That's kind of macro picture. I'm not I'm not an employee anymore. I'm an employer, and I think that's a point of pride for me because it allows me to create a culture that I want to work in, but also one that I think other people want to be a part of as well. So for me, it's massively motivating, uh, leading a team that, uh, yeah, that enjoys the job, like finding and creating work that's meaningful, work that's impactful and, uh, in an environment that I think is healthy. So for me, that's, 
that's definitely a point of pride. And then in terms of the work itself, I think I'm really proud of the fact that we do work that makes an impact. So one of our platforms is called the Digital Project Manager, and we're helping people deliver projects in a digital world. We're helping them deliver better projects, more value-driven projects, projects that are profitable, that come in on budget, on time, that have a scope that makes sense and matches the timeline in the budget. This is tough in a digital world. Like Delivering technical projects well is not an easy thing. And for me, I'm, I feel really proud every time that we get some positive feedback from people saying, <laughs> hey, I'm so glad I found you. Uh, this has been... This has been massively impactful. I got an email from someone who we've been coaching. Uh, it, was, it was on Thanksgiving, actually. And he was like, man, the thing I'm most thankful for this year is uh, our time together because it's just made a massive difference. And for me, that's a point of pride. It's the fact that, hey, this is, this is meaningful because it's impacting people's lives. It's helping them become more confident. It's helping them become more skilled. And I'm connecting people with one another who otherwise wouldn't be connected. And so for me, that is, that's meaningful. That's, that's purposeful. So I want to also think about, you know, given what you, what you know and the work you're doing and any and gaps that you see in the world today, what do you, what do you think is possible right now that's just not, not quite happening? Oh man, that's a that's a big question, isn't it? Possible in terms of what? Yeah, you know, I I like to <laughs> I like to ask the open question because sometimes folks are, it's just like you know often there's just something nagging at people. You know, it's like why? Just like in this day and age, why isn't it so that <laughs> uh, that we're not doing X or that or this is impossible? And so generally, if through the lens of the work you do. You know, when you look at like what could be possible and it's just not happening yet, I'm just curious if, if anything jumps out. Do you know what? I mean, this isn't related to my work, but every time I fill out a form, I can't help but thinking this is a complete waste of everyone's time. I was filling out a form, a form the other day. So I'm fi like, filling out a form. I'm talking about writing down things. So, like, when I go to the doctors and I have to tell them what my name and my address is. Well, hold on, hold on. So that's that's the worst because it's not only that you're having to do it, but you're having to do it for the tenth time because they can't seem to like use computers to keep <laughs> records. Yeah, and and I'm writing it down only for someone to to read it and type it. <laughs> it just seems like the most ridiculous problem that in 2020 you still write write down information on a piece of paper for someone to then put into a computer. So I don't know, man, that, that springs to mind as a, just a, a challenge, just a, a why challenge. But I think going back to kind of more of my day job in terms of what we do, in terms of helping people deliver projects in a digital world, I think one of the big challenges out there is this misalignment between uh, a re I guess a, a value misalignment in terms of what people are willing to pay and how much effort they think work or should it should take to deliver a project and the reality of what it actually takes. And what I'm, what I'm basically saying here is, you know, clients, stakeholders will think a project's a thousand dollar project when it in fact is a million dollar project. And I think there's this in the world of digital, there's so many, so many unknowns. So, so much of the time, actually, it, it could be a thousand dollar project, uh, or it could be a million dollar project, you know, depending on one small detail. And, uh, I think it's, it's the details that get people tripped up, but also create this, um, opaqueness around digital projects and about building things in a digital world which make it really hard for people to to understand why something is a million dollar project rather than a thousand dollar project and i think it's confused by the fact that you know every man and his dog knows someone who builds stuff my neighbor's a developer he says is a thousand dollar project uh and that just really creates a lot of confusion out there so when we're building things technically 
there's different there's you know there's enterprise grade uh ways that we that we build things there's there's building things properly and the, yes there's a quick hack patch version yes you can do it in squarespace uh or wix and you know it take you five minutes and i think that kind of the continuum of complexity in the world of digital and that opaqueness that comes with not quite understanding that continuum very well uh, makes managing projects in this environment really quite tricky absolutely um i've definitely seen that in so many so many realms you know whether it's like uh even like uh, remodeling projects you know in a home and it's like communication and and under getting to an understanding of the future which is why i love prototypes so much you know like we yeah. can you can get to so much certainty and get past all this ambiguity of like is this what you're talking about is this what you're talking about show this to your neighbor and see if they say they can build that for a thousand dollars yeah yeah i think there's so much value in I think, you know, I think there's so much value in a whiteboard and a quick sketch, even, mm. even, I mean, that is a prototype of sorts, but so much can, uh, there is so much confusion so often simply because people are misunderstanding one another. And, uh, I love drawing stuff out and like my notebooks full of diagrams of this line connected to that line. Uh, but it really just helps quickly sketching something, prototyping something effectively is what we're doing to help explain how information flows or how decisions are made or how things are connected or how data relates from one piece to another. So yeah, the, the ability to sketch something out as you're ex trying to explain something provides a lot of clarity sometimes in these situations where uh, you know that there's confusion. And I think that's actually the important thing is when you know that there might be confusion is just double, triple checking sure that <laughs> you're both on the same page with, does this make sense? What about this is confusing? Uh, and some of those kind of risk management questions start becoming really important. You know, it, it brings me back to this concept that, you know, questions are the facilitator Swiss army knife and, you know, if we're, if we can't make a prototype or, or maybe it's just the wrong context for it, you know, the just timing wise and the fidelity of what we're engaging upon, then we, we need to rely on questions to get past the ambiguity and the, the confusion and the, the lack of alignment. And so I'm always curious to hear about people's favorite questions. So like, what are some questions that you love to, to use when you're working with your team and you're trying to, to get uh, to a better understanding? Uh, even, even, I, even family, you know, some, some people love to do, high, what, what was your high low? You know, what, what are some of your favorite questions to, to get to more connection to better understanding? Yeah. I think, I mean, I like, I like asking why a lot and keep digging into the why. And particularly when we're thinking about strategy and goals, you know, asking the question, why, why are we doing this? Uh, and we can, you can ask that in lots of different ways. Why are we doing this? Um, but, um, understanding the goals, why, why are we doing this? Just getting some reassurance that people understand why, what, what impact we're trying to have here. Asking people again, like kind of strategy related questions, but okay. Well, so if that's why we're doing it, how, well, what are the what are the KPIs for that? Because often thinking about the KPIs, the key performance indicators can really help us think about why, what's the actual metric we're trying to move or shift. Um, so KPIs are super important. And just asking, well, how will we know if it's worked? Again, that's kind of linked back to the KPIs. How do we know if this is the right thing to do? And if how will we measure or know if it's worked? I think that's kind of right at the beginning of the project when we're trying to, we're in this prototype stage, but we're trying to work out if we're doing the right thing. Those are some really important questions to be asking. That reminds me of one of my favorites, which is how will we know if it didn't yeah. work? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, cause like if everyone, if you're just constantly searching for this, the rainbow, like we'll know it worked when we see the rainbow and you're just like, you never see it. It's like, mm, do we just go on for decades or like, do we have a, do we know some, have some rule to, that'll tell us when we pull yeah. the ripcord? I, I mean, similarly to that, a question I love is, okay, well, if this all fails, if this, 
if this all goes totally wrong, why would it why would it be? What would what does total failure look like? Um and then how would that have happened? Mm. How would that failure have occurred? Yeah. So it's kind of we're looking at risk. Uh, again, we're looking at are we doing the right thing, but also then thinking about, okay, well, how now can we steer around that? What can we do to avoid, to mitigate or to transfer that that risk? Does it mean if that's the worst thing that could happen, if that's really what failure looks like, how do we run a million miles away from that? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like a, lo- a couple of other questions to think about, you know, because like sometimes you ask the question why, or sometimes I ask the question why, and people look at me and with a blank stare. And so I, I like to, to say things like, well, what if this is not good enough? Or what would the world look like if this didn't happen? You know, like just starting to challenge some of the, just reframe it and let people see it from different angles. Because I think, uh, so often people get uh, enamored with an idea and it becomes like, you, you know, the best thing in the world and we have to bring them down to reality. Yeah. <laughs> Man, yeah, talking about bringing people back down to reality, one of the things when we're estimating projects or thinking about, yeah, what it's, how we're going to build something, one of the things I like to ask people at the end of the, uh, the end of the process of estimation, they've just told me it's going to take 40 hours to do something. And I'll say, well, what could we do in 20 hours? And, you know, there's that crushing moment for them when they're like, man, we've just done this. Uh, It's a 40 hour thing. But actually thinking about what you could do in half the time or half the cost. What if you only had half? What would you do then? Because then often we can simplify things to the really essential components. um, And it really helps people work out, okay, what the more simple approach is. So, uh, trying to help people simplify things, I think, can be can be really useful. You know, it's also handy to ask, "What would you do if you had yeah. more time?" Because then you then you can find out where people are cutting corners. So I like to I like the idea of like, "What if you only had half the time?" Because then you can find out like, what, if people really had to prioritize, what would they cut? But then if you had if you had more time, like sometimes you can find the, the gotchas, which is like, well. I am, I am cutting, I am doing this a little, a little half fast over here. It's like, oh, okay. Well, maybe we should take a look at that. Yeah. I mean, do you know, we just actually issued an RFP and one of the things that we, one of the things that we put in there was what, what's the most important thing that we've left out of this RFP? And it wasn't, it was not meant to be a trick question, but more just to give people the ability to, to add in scope. Sometimes, we have, we you know, we're blinkered. We think we know what our project should be and we think we know why we're doing it, but we miss out on a whole uh, area of opportunity simply because we're just too blinkered to see it. So giving people that get out of jail free card, um, I think can be, can just open ourselves up to some opportunity that we might not otherwise realize. I love that. And I think that's a, a great spot to end on this notion of opportunity that we didn't know we could realize. And uh, isn't that a powerful concept, you know, like just thinking about ways that we can unlock new opportunity. Um, Want to just give you a moment to give our listeners a final thought. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that I've just been thinking about recently is um, risk, risk management and, and being uh, making unpredictable things predictable and just this this idea of we can minimize risk we all want our projects to run as as smoothly as possible and one of the ways that we can do that is by mitigating against the risk and making unpredictable things predictable so again i think it's about asking the right questions about what can we do how can we change our approach how can we change the scope how can we adapt the deliverables how can we make this more predictable? Because ultimately, going back to what we we're talking about at the beginning there in terms of the, the strategy, like we're all doing things because we're wanting to have an impact. There's a reason for why why we're doing things. We want we're wanting to shift KPIs, we're wanting to have impact. And we want that impact uh to not be unpredictable. So I think about one thing that I'm finding really useful is okay well how do we simplify this so that we make it predictable how can we 
How can we reduce the uncertainty and maximize the opportunity for positive risk? Because the risk can go both ways, right? It can be, there can be negative risk and positive risk and finding opportunities to make things certain by making them simpler, I think can be incredibly powerful. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today, Ben. And uh, thanks a lot for sharing and being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun chatting with you. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. And if you want more, head over to our blog, where I post weekly articles and resources about working better together. VoltageControl.com.